Welcome everyone and thank you for joining Southern Maryland Audubon's really important and timely presentation on the on the trail of the invasive lan lantern spotted lantern fly. We have Maryland Department of Agriculture entomologist Kenton Sumter with us. I'm Molly Moore. I'm president of Southern Maryland Audubon. Southern Maryland Audubon works for the protection of birds and their habitat across Southern Maryland and beyond through our educational outreach like this presentation, as well as in our conservation programs. Um, you don't have to be a member to join us for any of our educational programs, but we more than welcome any of you who might wanna join us who aren't members already. It's really easy to sign up. You just sign up on our webpage, southernmarylandaudubon.org. We record all of our Zoom programs and those archives on a wide range of bird and wildlife and gardening subjects are free for viewing by anyone on our webpage and our YouTube channel. So tonight, um, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Kenton Sumter, as an entomologist with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. But he's not just any entomologist. He's a detective on the trail of the spotted lanternfly. It's been a fascinating and incredibly important mission. This invasive species is a threat to many of our native trees and some of our important agricultural crops. Kenton comes to the spotted lanternfly by way of his own fascinating career path. He received an undergraduate degree in wildlife and fish fisheries from Frostburg State University in 2011. And during a research project in the Republic of Panama, he discovered a major interest in insects. That led him to Virginia Tech for grad school, where he joined a lab working on the hemlock woolly adelgid. From there, he joined the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, where he was an inspector at coal mine reclamation sites. In 2021, with a chance to get back to bugs, he joined the Maryland Department of Agriculture as an entomologist. Kenton, thank you so much for this presentation, and I turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you guys having me on, and um, hopefully I can educate some of you guys about some spotted lanternfly, because it is a bit of a bug. Let me get this thing fired up here. On PowerPoint. Alrighty. I'm hoping everybody can see that. It's looking pretty good on my end. So... I'm Kenton Sumter, an entomologist with the Maryland Department of Agriculture, and um, I have been working for the last year and a half on spotted lanternfly. Um, it's a pest that comes to us from Eastern Asia, and it is definitely a threat to our state agriculture and also kind of the population at large. Um, it is a real public nuisance, a real pain in the butt to have to live beside. So as I go through this presentation, I'm going to kind of describe its life history, um, some kind of tidbits about it, and then a lot of what the state is doing to try and mitigate the problem of lanternfly. At the very end, I've got kind of a cool series of slides that actually show the citizen reporting system that we use, because really when it comes to us finding out where lanternfly is, we're relying entirely on Maryland residents. So it's really kind of a cool thing to show what all of the Marylanders reporting is looking like um, on our end, because uh, unfortunately we can't go and show that map to, to the population at large. And the very end, I have um, a rundown of some of the research being done to uh, find biological controls to try and uh, get after spotted lanternfly and, uh, and rein it in a little bit. So to begin with, the spotted lanternfly is just a leafhopper. Um, it's big. If no one's seen it, the adults are out right now. Um, they are mating and they're looking for places to lay their eggs, and they're going to be gone by like November when the first frosts come. But um, if you happen to see them, First off, let us know, because the town here in Southern Maryland, it's going to be kind of a surprise for us to find a bunch of lanternfly. We don't typically find them in the southern part of the state, but um, they're large. I say a big adult female is going to be something like an inch or an inch and a half long. The males are noticeably smaller, but um, they are very vibrantly colored. Once you see them, you don't miss them. They've got the kind of buff wings and black dots. And even when they're little, they're really kind of shocking looking. They um, have jet black carapace with big white polka dots on them. And um, yeah, like, like I said, once you see them, you never forget what lanternfly looks like. But um, they are leafhoppers. Uh, they come to us from Eastern Asia. They're actually invasive in a lot of East Asia as well. So places like Vietnam, Japan, Korea, um, they've invaded and farmers there have had to try and figure out how to go and deal with lanternfly for longer than we have. But um, they are more endemic to places like Southern India, 
um, I'm sorry, Eastern India, Southern China, and places like that. We only have one generation per year. So they hatch out in the early spring, like the first week of May, and they'll metamorphose. I'm sorry, not metamorphose. They will grow, they will molt from that point all the way up until their adulthood, um, sometime around like July. And then we'll have those guys through until about November, and then they'll all die off. And we'll just have their eggs that overwinter. So we have four nymphalin stars, one adult life stage, and then the egg masses for an overwintering life stage. And they are sexually dimorphic. Females are bigger than males. So if anyone finds them in the northern part of the state, uh, you'll see the big females have big yellow fatty sides to them, and they're all full of eggs. And the males are just itty bitty. And um, I think actually starting to drop now the cold weather after they've made it. They don't have a lot of um, uh, a lot of energy left. But this little chart kind of shows a handy dandy way of keeping track of the life cycle. Starting off where we are right now, um, I don't really have a pointer. I don't know if anybody can see my pointer, but the egg laying phase um, starting in September, really taking off in like October is, um, is where we are right now. So people are seeing more lanternfly now than ever. Um, this is because they're swarming. They're seeing them in places where lanternfly wouldn't normally be seen. Um, they're finding them on tree species lanternfly wouldn't typically eat because they're trying to find good places to lay their eggs. Uh, when lanternfly are young, the early nymphal instars, they like to eat a variety of plants. So the wider spread they are, the more plants they can eat, the more competitive it makes those early nymphal instars. Um, once they get to be big adults, they have some species they really kind of come back to. Um, right now, we're finding a lot of adults on like silver maples, red maples, tree of heaven, always tree of heaven, if anybody's not familiar with it, it's an invasive tree species. Um, it came over in the 1800s, I think, for like street sidewalk uh, beautification and it's really just taken off. Once you see it, you see it all over the interstate and everywhere else, uh, cities. But um, once it freezes in November, we will lose our adults. They'll die out almost entirely immediately and we'll have our egg masses. Um, they'll persist until about, I said, the first week in May and then the new nymphal instars will hatch. Um, they're very tiny. People usually miss them. They'll be just hidden underneath the trees, you know, on tree trunks, on, um, on limbs, but they'll also hide their egg masses on like, trailers or construction materials or buildings. So over the winter, it's worth it if uh, if you live in an infested area, just keep your eyes peeled for egg masses and just crush them wherever you find them. And they kind of look like big gray waxy splotches about the size of an adult, so like an inch and a half long. Sometimes there'll be a couple of them side by side, but you can use anything, just run it over the egg mass and crush them. And that's between like 30 and 50 insects inside of there. So you really can kind of make a big impact on the invasion next year. But when they hatch out, they're very small. Um, people usually miss them. It's not until about the fourth instar in like June when people actually start noticing spotted lanternfly because they get big red flanks and big white dots. Um, prior to that, people will mistake them for like ants or spiders or things like that. But um, once it gets to be about July, the final molt will bring them up to adults. And that's the thing people are most familiar with are those adult lanternflies. So their behavior, uh, they are sap, see, uh, sap feeders. So they have a big old proboscis. They will stick into a plant and they feed on stems and trunks and branches. They don't eat leaves. Um, they don't burrow into the trees. They don't, um, they don't uh, girdle trees when they feed. So the nice thing is when they're feeding, they don't typically cause any real harm to the tree. Um, on Tree of Heaven, we'll see a lot of like sap weeping out because um, they feed so communally, they'll actually kind of create wounds. But on most tree species, they're not causing a loss of vegetation. Um, they're not uh, girdling and killing actual tree tissue. So that's nice. You don't really have to worry about ornamentals or trees on your property. They have been known to kill tree of heaven. No one's terribly sad about that. Like whatever, you know, the invasive insect is killing the invasive tree. No one's terribly worried about it. You'll find them a lot on tree of heaven, uh, especially as adults, but they will prefer or they'll prefer uh, or their preferred secondary host, excuse me can include grape. They really attack grapes very aggressively. Um, and that's the commodity we're worried about too, they're grapevines and vineyards. But um, cultivated grape, wild grape, you'll find them all over those vines. Uh, black walnut is very, very popular. Silver maples and red maples this time of year are very popular. Willow trees, so your black willows, weeping willows, things like that. I don't know why, but they seem to like them. Um, and then Eastern white pine, actually. They really will go for white pine, especially during the summer. But they actually feed on like 70 to, I think it's like 82 species of known plant in the North Americas. Um, well, Eastern North America, they're not in the West yet, but um, they eat everything. And it really is kind of the issue with them is that they eat everything. There is no one plant we can treat. 
um, when we get out in the field and we try and do our treatments or we do our crapping or things like that, we pretty much stick with tree of heaven because it's an invasive, there's not a lot of native insects or native birds that are like worried about using it for a food source. So we're trying to make a small environmental impact, but even getting rid of tree of heaven, lanternfly can feed off of anything. And, um, and in their home ranges, they exist in places where tree of heaven isn't present. So it's by no means a guarantee that if we get rid of tree of heaven, we'll get rid of lanternfly. It'll just be less attractive for them. So I'm gonna hit a few different topics. Um, the quarantine, which is very important for people to know about, uh, the trapping that we do, our delineations, our treatments, outreach, and the research at the very end. This is a cool map. I actually need to update it because I'm pretty sure it has changed dramatically since March uh, 28th. But this is provided by the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program, and it is a map of the entire invasion of spotted lanternfly in the United States. And it has changed because we now have lanternfly in North Carolina and Michigan, and I forget where else, but it is spreading. Uh, the blue is where people have found every single life stage, so we know that there's an established reproducing population. Um, the red outline is where states have individually instituted their quarantines, and then they can barely see it, but there's purple dots that mark where lanternfly have been found, like hit hiking. We haven't established that they're um, that they're there as a uh, as a reproducing population, but we've gotten hitchhikers who collected adults or collected some life stage, and um, and it's you know very suspicious. For Maryland, we actually did change our quarantine. So if anyone was familiar, um, the quarantine was established in 2019, and it was only Cecil and Harford counties. This year, the very start of the year in January, we actually went ahead and expanded it to 11 counties. So we added nine more. And it's, as you can see, you know, the north central part of the state. And what the quarantine really is, is not a, a law enforcement crackdown on people traveling between the states. You know, we're not inspecting vehicles. We're not impounding shipments of things. Um, the quarantine really is an educational tool. Um, we want to get people within the quarantine uh, familiar with Lanternfly, able to identify it and really working to slow the spread. So engaging in management operations on their own because the state can't, can't be everywhere at once. There's too many people, too many lantern flies, too many properties. But if folks are able to um, keep their vehicle sanitary, not accidentally move lantern fly from an uninfested area to a new infested area, um, that will at least keep it from getting to new locations because nobody wants to live beside lantern fly. Uh, we don't want our vineyards getting attacked increasing the cost of wine because they have to go and spray more to kill more of these bugs. Um, and then people that have to live beside lanternfly have thousands of bugs in the trees. You know, they're sneaking into your home. Um, they produce a honeydew when they feed, which can cause mold to grow or attract bees or wasps. Um, they're just really a nasty bug to have to live beside. Kind of the same idea as like the stink bug. It's just a nuisance to have around you all the time. When we're looking for these insects, we will do trapping as one of our big ones. Um, we'll trap areas where historically they've always existed to kind of keep an eye on if the infestation is still there, what life stages are changing, um, but we'll put traps in new areas too. If we think lanternfly is gonna wind up somewhere, for example, like in Charles County on the border with um, the Potomac, that we know that they're over in Prince William in Virginia, and we know that lanternfly can swim. I think the picture I have right now is like a lanternfly on a black walnut that's bobbing along in the water. If anybody can see it, I turned off my self view screen so I can't tell what I'm showing, but, um, but yeah, like we'll find them floating in the water. Um, they'll swim down the Susquehanna River. Like they could potentially cross that body of water. And um, we put up traps on likely a uh, little tree of heaven to try and see if maybe we can catch them and realize they're in a new area. But, um, but our circle traps are nice. They are not so prone to catching like birds and mice and things the way that like a sticky band would. The circle trap is literally an upside down funnel that the bugs might just walk up inside of and they'll get stuck in the bag at the very top and, um, and just expire and then we'll collect them. So, um, so we don't use sticky bands for, if anybody is curious, the state doesn't put out sticky bands. Um, we're worried about catching things that we're not intending to catch because um, we only check them every two weeks. So we just, can't be out there to go and rescue any other critter that gets stuck to them. But, um, but if a person were to want to go trap their, um, their own properties, the sticky bands are fine. It's just check them regularly, make sure nobody's stuck to them. Um, and sometimes those sticky bands can actually come with like a batting, a cotton batting on the outside that can keep birds from getting stuck to them and, um, and kind of just catch lanternfly. 
excuse me. So our delineations have actually changed a little bit. Um, used to, we would respond to resident complaints every single time and just go out, survey around the property, survey a buffer around that property and try and find out the extent of an infestation. Um, but it has gotten to be the case where there are so many complaints that we just can't get out to every single one of them. So we've been targeting properties that are particularly at risk and surveying them to see if we can find tree of heaven, lanternfly, and like get it set up for an insecticidal treatment. But this is kind of a map of what we were doing. We were looking at all these different locations and the green is where we didn't find anything. The red was positive and the yellow is kind of suspicious. Like we saw wounded tree of heaven, weeping sap, but we didn't find a lanternfly. And our treatments have gotten pretty narrow. So we do not have a residential treatment program. People always wanna know if we'll come out and kill lanternfly on their properties. And by and large, we can't. We are really focusing on businesses that tend to be uh, adjacent to rails, major trucking and shipping, um, and then ag businesses, so like nurseries, orchards, and vineyards. Um, is about the limit of places we can supply, even try and get like some promise of treatment too. Um, new populations as well, and even these locations are getting kind of old now. A lot of these have been subsumed by larger populations. But if we can get to a new location and knock it down real fast, we hope we can kind of slow that spread. Um, but sometimes it doesn't always work. There's a lot of lantern flies. And we use GIS. Um, this is the fun thing, doing art projects, building maps, putting together all these parcel information, just, you know, making a, a fully interactive system for our field crew to go use. Um, this is something that I've had a lot of fun getting to use. And I just kind of like sharing our, uh, our tactical map, as it were, of uh, Hagerstown in this case. But you can see that we're trying to target locations that are directly adjacent to the railways that run through Hagerstown. So the greens are places that we're trying to get to. Uh, the blues are areas that we've already hit as of, I think, July, I think is when I made this presentation. So it's a little bit out of date, but, um, but these are locations that we've attacked along those rail lines and, um, and just try to knock down population so that plant fly hopefully won't be as thick on the rails and won't get sent down a line to Virginia or West Virginia or somewhere else. Because um, they love rails. They will hitchhike, they'll hop on rail cars, and they'll just ride um, until they hop off. And this is just a bit more of a close-up view. This is kind of like how we wind up planning our, uh, our attacks on Lanternfly. And we like to get out, too, um, doing this kind of stuff, being out here doing uh, presentations at the Audubon Society, getting out in person, um, doing trade shows and horse shows, state fairs, agronomy meetings, master gardener, master naturalist schools, basically anything to kind of get the word out and, um, and get people interested in Lanternfly, telling your friends about Lanternfly. Um, we've got a lot of cool outreach materials that people love to go and collect. So we try and make it fun and educational and, um, and keep, us, keep us moving, keep us doing stuff out with the public. Because we really rely on citizen reporting. That's the big one. Um, this is information from last year, uh, starting pretty much from like May through December. And um, we've got an email service, a phone line, and a newly introduced survey. Um, so the emails and the phones, previously that was the only system that people could report on, but we want to like reserve that for management related questions or permitting questions associated with the quarantine uh, for businesses and, um, and things like that. So we're not looking for people to tell us where they find Lanternfly through email. We're hoping they go to the survey one, two, three, which is a service provided by ArcGIS where they can actually input a bunch of fields, place a point on a map, and show us exactly where they found lanternfly. And then we can go in there, and if we need to, we can get back in touch with people, you know, plan our treatments based upon where these points are popping up, and just kind of track the infestation and see where it's going. But we get a lot of engagement. As you can see, we get thousands of emails, thousands of phone calls, and the survey responses from last year were 6,200. I think at this point, I'm like approaching 9,500 something, almost maybe 10,000 reports and we're only into October. So it's still gonna run through the month of October and um, it might break 10,000. So, and that's when they let small beans too compared to like New Jersey and New York and Pennsylvania where there are just tens of thousands of reports every month. So Marylanders can count themselves lucky. Uh, other states have it harder. We don't have lantern fly quite that bad. But I wanna run through this series of pictures to kind of show folks if they do contribute to our map, um, what they're actually, what their reports are looking like. Like, so this was from July last year. Um, we started this on the 12th, and this is 342 responses from the public to Survey 123, um, showing us where people found lanternfly. 
And you can see already where the infestation falls. You've got Cecil spilling over into Hartford, um, even some infiltration into Baltimore County. And then Hagerstown is kind of like the Western Maryland nexus of lanternfly. And then just hitchhikers scattered throughout. Some are misidentifications, but we get hitchhikers all over the state. Like the bugs just travel everywhere. In August, it's much more apparent where the insects are moving. We've got hitchhikers moving through uh, New Windsor in Frederick and um, Carroll County. We've got Sykesville in Howard County that's starting to get full up. Hagerstown is gone, like end to end. The city is just full of lanternfly. Um, and northern Baltimore County is now being infiltrated. You know, Hartford and Cecil are completely enemy territory and, um, and Baltimore is starting to go too. And the hitchhikers just keep on showing up, even out as far out as uh, Garrett. Although I think that one was a misidentification uh, last year. But this year we've actually had two pop up in Garrett County where people, you know, visitors I imagine have brought them to gas stations or uh, rental homes near Deep Creek. So like they show up from one end of the state to the other. And it's, uh, it's a lot of running around to try and find these things. So August is relatively quiet. In September, it really takes off. September and October are our, our mating and, and swarming seasons. And it just shows you, you know, lanternfly is just all over the state. In October, fully involved Baltimore City, most all of, uh, of Washington County, going from Frederick down to 270 through Montgomery. And, um, and this year we found uh, expansions into um, Prince George's County, Queen Anne's, Talbot, um, Wicomico, like it just, it goes and goes and goes and pops up. We try and get to these new locations and try and treat them, um, but it takes time. You know, we have to get out there, do our surveys, find out where Lanternfly is, get legal agreements from property owners to go treat, and then finally get out there and treat. And um, the bugs unfortunately move faster than we do. By November, they frozen, reports have dropped off, and by December, we're finally done. Just 10 responses, probably people finding egg masses or dead adults or something like that. But you can see by the end of 2021, the extent of lanternfly in Maryland. And it's, it's really obvious just moving how it came from its small, you know, well, not small, but, you know, its initial footholds in Cecil and Hartford and Hagerstown and just spreads out from there and shoots down highways and rail lines. And um, it's, I guess neat from an analytic standpoint, but kind of depressing from a management standpoint. So spotted lanternfly in 2022 for Maryland, uh, state of Maryland, we're really trying to move our priorities to warehouses, distribution centers, railways, and um, orchard nurseries and vineyards. We just can't do residential, there's too many. Um, we wanna keep up our outreach. We've actually got a lot of um, public media that we're working on and like targeted internet ads to go and get people aware of it. Um, our internet digital ad campaign did really well. We had something like a million people that went and looked at our ads and something on the order of 30,000 that actually clicked through that ad and came to our website to find out more, which I think is a really good engagement. So we're going to keep doing that. So keep your eye peeled on the internet. You might see an ad for spotted lanternfly somewhere. Um, but we've taken out ads in local papers, uh, billboards we'll go and put together just to try and get people aware that lanternfly are around and, um, and get you killing it and reporting it. But um, for 2022, for 2023, SLF is going to continue expanding. There's going to be more lantern flies. Um, there's some indications in Pennsylvania that they've actually started to reduce their populations, uh, but we don't quite know why. They might be eating away all the tree of heaven. They might be moving because their good food source is kind of getting depleted. Um, but for Maryland, we are years behind Pennsylvania's invasion. So I don't expect lantern fly to cease at the outbreak level probably for another couple of years, which is a bummer for people living in like Haver de Grace and Perryville, where there's just millions of the insects, but, um, but kind of coexist, we have to, because we can't spray them all. You know, they're in the landscape. It'd be an ecological disaster to try and exterminate lanternfly. Um, so it's up to Marylanders to try and make sure they're slowing the spread, keeping your vehicle sanitary, not accidentally moving lanternfly to new locations and squishing them where you find them. And just let us know, you let us know where you find them. And, um, We'll plug in the map and be better educated. And um, and yeah, that's kind of what we're looking at for 2022 going into 2023. Um, and then obviously we'll just keep an eye on, on new positive areas that pop up. Unfortunately, Anne Arundel and Wycomico are kind of old news. Now it's even further afield. So we're looking at Allegheny County and Garrett County and um, you know, Somerset, you know, down towards Pocomoke and Salisbury. So as far as research goes, there's some really cool stuff. 
Um, biocontrol efforts are ongoing. Nothing has been a breakthrough, but obviously biocontrol is like the gold standard for management. It can take a long time. You're talking a decade plus to actually go and do host range testing, insect releases, trying to make sure the parasitoid populations are like actually sustainable. Um, so it's, it's a long effort. Um, but we do have one wasp already that was introduced to go and attack, excuse me, attack spongy moth, uh, formerly known as dipsy moth, that is also going after lanternfly. So that's awesome, um, but it's not specific. So it's mostly going after spongy moth, but you know, we'll take what we can get. Um, the Anastatus orientalis, you know, it's got possible non-targets that it's gonna go after and that's just not really acceptable because we don't wanna introduce a parasitoid that's gonna go and hit lanternfly and then attack every other leaf hopper that it can find. Um, same for Dranostinicus, like if its host range is narrow enough, maybe it could be introduced. But if it's going to go after other leaf hoppers or other, you know, hemipteran brew bugs, um, it's just not going to work. You know, we don't want to make the situation even worse. And there's also native fungus that are going after the lanternfly. Um, we're finding Bavaria bassiana in places like Fair Hill and Back River out in like Hartford County and Cecil County. Um, I guess that's more close to Cecil and Queen Anne's County, I'm sorry, Kent County. Um, but yeah, we've had um, the park staff at Fair Hill actually send in um, fungus coated lanternfly to Cornell University to try and see what, what's cultivating on these insects. Because um, anything native that's communicable would just be great. You know, if there's an entomopathogenic fungus that's killing lanternfly, it'd be awesome. So if you find lanternfly that have little cotton balls or they got filaments that are sticking them to a tree, like go ahead and get that bug pop it in some high strength alcohol and, um, and contact us and, you know, try and let us know and we'll, you know, maybe come out and get it from you or have you mail it to us and uh, send it to University of Maryland and see if they want to try and ID that fungus that's growing on those insects. But, um, but yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, something, you know, natural predators start to go after this bug. And some do. Um, we've got mantids, wheel bugs, sometimes known as assassin bugs, spiders, big insectivorous birds, They'll all attack lanternfly. Um, domesticated fowl, like um, you know, chickens and things like that, apparently are really good for it. So you know, get those native predators and really try and promote them in your gardens or just around your home. Um, if you can, try and get those Carolina mantids that are you know struggling to. Don't get the Chinese ones if you can help it. But um, anything eating lanternfly is obviously good news. And when it comes down to how people can help, what we're really looking for is people to be familiar with lanternfly and being able to identify each life stage. Uh, reporting it to us when you find it, especially for Southern Maryland, because we've not positively identified lanternfly like established populations in any Southern County. Um, so if you see it, report it, let us know, hang on to your carcass um, for Southern Maryland, because we're going to need that as a voucher specimen to go and send to the USDA. Um, and I would say go ahead and like go to the email, email us and we'll get back to you about that, um, rather than just placing a post on the, um, the survey one, two, three. Um, and then any that you find, Kill them, don't let them live. You know, they're pretty. Some people have a problem with destroying them, but they're an invasive and they're a pain in the butt to have to live with. So better off to destroy them. I do caution folks though, there's no reason to go nuclear. Um, Lanternfly aren't gonna destroy your ornamental. They're not gonna destroy your uh, gardens. Um, there's no reason to spray indiscriminately to kill lanternfly because you're gonna kill everything else too. All the beneficial insects, you're gonna nuke um, while you're also trying to kill lanternfly. So be judicious, maybe just spray, you know, the things that you absolutely must. Um, and, you know, Tree of Heaven is a good one. Concentrations of lanternfly on Tree of Heaven, sticking with contact insecticides, even things like um, horticultural oils or insecticidal soaps. You kind of limit your environmental impact, even though they're not, you know, they're not gonna kill the bugs lightning fast, um, but it's better than spraying, you know, really powerful uh, systemic insecticides or like having a contractor come out and, do a foliar drench of a tree just to go and kill lanternfly. And, um, and yeah, that's kind of just what I want to caution people is there's no reason to go nuclear on lanternfly. We're going to have to coexist and, uh, and learn to go and live with them. And this is just our contact information. We've got us at don'tbug.md at maryland.gov. This is our office line for the plant protection and weed management office. If you call that, um, you can leave a message with um, with the voicemail tree, and it'll direct you to the lanternfly mailbox. And um, you can tell us preferentially management questions. We're really looking for people that need like a question answered when it comes to phone calls. And if you find lanternfly, 
go to the survey, fill it out, put a point in the map, and if we need to, we can get back in touch. But um, but that's it. Basically, as far as Lanternfly goes, it's kind of the outlook that we're looking at, sort of the scale of the infestation. Um, and um, if anyone's got questions, I am more than happy to go ahead and answer them. Thanks so much, Kenton. That was absolutely great. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. Um, one before maybe while you still have your screen up there. Some, well, sure, uh, I can share again. Yeah, is asking if you could show a picture of the eggs and how big they are. Gotcha. You know, hmm. I've got some other pictures. Let me dig around real fast here. I've got some stuff just hiding in my pictures uh, folder on my computer. Maybe I can share a couple of uh, pictures. Oh, I missed that one. Hold on, buddy. Oops. Anyways, I know that's showing up very strangely. Okay, let's screen share. So if everybody can see that all right, this is a fairly old egg mass, but it's actually not hatched out. This is what it would look like towards the end of winter and the beginning of spring is um, kind of cracked and scrabbly and dry. This would be maybe an inch and a half long, um, you know, half an inch to an inch wide. It's fairly noticeable once you see it, but they tend to hide them really well. They'll stick them on the underside, the branches and things like that. Um, but if you've noticed lanternfly congregating in certain areas, very likely that an egg mass or two or hundreds sometimes will be located in that same area because lanternfly females once they're gravid uh, don't tend to move very far from kind of where they where they start um, you know getting big but um, I'd like to find a better picture of of just the egg masses but apparently the pictures I have are HTMLs which is less than useful and so and someone's asking also what they should look for on their car. Would they see these egg masses or what would they see if they were hitchhiking on their car? So typically a hitchhiker is going to be an adult. Um, the egg masses might get stuck to a trailer or something that was staying like in one location for a long time, um, especially if you have host trees to like overhang a trailer and that trailer sits there for, you know, weeks or months and then gets moved. The likelihood of there being um, gravid females that drop onto it and lay their egg masses and then, you know, expire or leave is much, much higher. And um, if everyone can see um, the picture of the adults actively laying eggs, is that showing up on the screen? Uh, no, we're seeing the egg mass, the first one that you put up. Okay. Let's see if I can't screen sharing. Let's stop share. Do a new share. How about now? Um, it said you, ah, here we go. Yeah. Okay, good deal. So this is a little bit better. It kind of gives you a better idea of how the, the size of the egg masses and how they look early in the season when they go down. Sometimes they're just a little shinier, but this is what you're, you're looking at is like an egg mass about the size of an adult and, um, and they'll be stuck to the tree like this. But um, there is the potential for them to be on vehicles too. And sometimes they're very like sneaky. They'll be like up under wheel wells where the, um, the females go to hide and lay their eggs. But um, yeah, that's kind of what they do. And Mary asks, if they, if they only eat sap, what is the actual damage they're doing to the tree or the plant? So it's not well known. Um, there's ongoing research to see what exactly it is lanternfly do to plants. But largely what we're finding is that they can um, cause reduced yield for like fruit bearing trees or things like that. Um, we have vineyard owners that have accused plants and fly of reducing their uh, their grape yield. And um, what we've also been finding is that they seem to really affect the winter hardiness of grape vines in particular. But I would tend to think too that they're robbing the trees of carbohydrate, like they're stealing food from the trees that the trees would otherwise go and sequester, or I should just say plants in general. Um, but they're stealing uh, carbohydrate that the plants would otherwise sequester in their roots. And that's going to impact winter hardiness. So particularly heavy lanternfly feeding could mean that an already old or sick or diseased plant 
might be pushed over the edge, it might be killed. Um, but what we've been told by USDA researchers is that they're still not really responsible as a primary like source of mortality in plants. Um, people are very quick to go and blame lanternfly for just decimating every tree on their property. But likely if you're seeing heavy damage on trees, it's probably something else. That's probably like a fungal pathogen that's killing, you know, browning leaves um, or wood boring insects that are that are drilling through, um, you know, drilling through the cambium and killing branches or things like that. Um, lanternfly really haven't been found in Pennsylvania to defoliate anything, which is great news because there's so many of them. But as far as the long-term ecological effects, really don't know yet. And um, yeah, research is kind of ongoing. Uh, Barb is asking, do they fly? They do, yep. Only the adults. Um, the Every single life stage can jump like crazy. They're really, really powerful jumpers. Um, they're almost impossible to catch. Like you got to go after them like three times, you know, smack them and try and get them. And finally on the third try, they're too tired and you can get them and squick them. But the adults will fly. Um, they'll fly pretty far distances too. Like they'll cross a farm field, just kind of fluttering along in the breeze. But they're very clumsy. They're not like, they're not like a bee, no. They'll kind of hop and flutter and just sort of cruise along um, in really dense areas. I'll smack them out of the air as they're flying. But um, but the adults will fly. The little ones don't. Um, the first through the fourth head stars can't fly. And Alba says that she saw um, uh, a video of someone catching adults with a plastic bottle. Could you describe mm -hmm. or explain how that works? Yeah, so they tend to jump directly away from whatever they're on. So a lot of people have been taking like Gatorade bottles and they'll put them right over top of the adult and they'll just ping off the tree and get trapped in the bottle. And then you can cap the bottle and you can keep doing that. You know, if you've got dozens of lantern fly in one bottle, you just keep on doing it until you can't keep them contained anymore. And then you can, you know, put the bottle in the freezer and destroy them that way. Um, I think that'd be a fairly low impact way of managing lantern fly on your property if you had, you know, a couple dozen, or, you know, even a couple hundred maybe, um, you know, so you wouldn't have to go out there and like physically smack at them and try and, you know, hit them on the tree. You could just try and place a bottle over top of them and have them jump into it. Um, and um, there's also a question of asking you, which is the app to do the report, to report the sightings on? So the best way to do it, I'm sorry, I actually forgot to mention, if you search us um, at MDA Spotted Lanternfly, that's the best way to find us because the URL for our website is just long and impossible to remember. But if you search MDA Spotted Lanternfly, we should be the first people to come back in your Google search results. And the survey is right front and center on that website. Um, it's um, actually, you know what, I can just share it. Let's just do that because that would be the most sensible thing to do right now. And John is asking, are there any citizen programs for trapping them? No, there's no, well, I guess I shouldn't say no. To my knowledge, there aren't any. Um, but if there are small groups that are doing that, then that might be something people are pursuing kind of at a smaller scale. The state hasn't wrangled people to do that um, yet. But um, uh, there may be local interest in doing that kind of thing. Let's see here. So I'm going to share. I wonder if it'll follow links when I share um, my current screen. Let's see if it does it. Got to find the correct screen here. Okay, so you guys can see all this. So if everyone can see, this is the website that we run, and the survey link is the central picture right here. If you see a spot of lanternfly, report it, and then hopefully. Um, It'll just follow. If we go to a new page, can people still see that? Are we on a new page? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good deal. So yeah, that's all it is. You just go and click on that link through our website. And it'll take you to this um, this whole thing. And there's just field after field. Um, some are required. Like we need to go and have a name for the person who's reporting it and, um, and a location for the lantern fly. But most everything else is optional. And it just gives us more and more information about um, where you're located and, well, I'm not sorry, where you're located, but where the lantern fly you found is located. And, um, and then from there, we can just go and we can port that straight over to another uh, ArcGIS map and compare that to property maps and see where it is people are discovering lantern fly. But um, yeah, I've not tried to access this on mobile, so I don't know what it looks like if somebody's like on a mobile browser, but um, hopefully it's fairly intuitive. We, uh, we don't get too many complaints of, um, of people having trouble with it. 
I would say if you do have problems with trying to submit a report, just close your browser if you can, you know, clear your cache, excuse me, clear your cache, and then just open it back up and try again. Um, occasionally people have problems like trying to upload photos or things like that. Um, we do require photographs. This is new. Uh, last year, we only got about a third of reports that had photos with them. And anything less, it's really hard to verify that people are actually finding lanternfly. And sometimes people will give information that's just greatly exaggerated or just not super useful. They'll say that they saw a bug somewhere. And it's like without a photo, we could be driving to, you know, Pocomoke City and realize that somebody found a grasshopper. And it's like, We've got to have good quality control on our reporting system, and um, and that annoys some people, unfortunately. But with uh, with it required to have a photograph submitted with your sighting report, it can guarantee you can try and verify that what you're looking at is lanternfly. So as a result, we're getting fewer reports, but ideally we're getting higher quality reports, and um, and I think that's a worthy sacrifice in that regard. But yeah, that's the the survey that we're using. And uh, Kenton, I don't know if this is in your bailiwick or not, but um, we have a question of whether uh, there are any efforts to eradicate the uh, tree of heaven on public lands. You were kind of breaking up there a little bit. What was the last thing you said? Efforts to eradicate the what? The, the uh, tree of heaven on public lands. No, so I shouldn't say no, but there are some places that are doing that. Some state parks will do heavy management. Some federal properties will do management of Tree of Heaven, but the Department of Agriculture doesn't and DNR Forestry does not. So some folks think there might be like a grant program to like have people come out and kill Tree of Heaven, um, but there isn't, unfortunately. But um, I know like some properties are, are pretty aggressive in managing Tree of Heaven. And when it comes down to residents, it's just kind of a matter of your, of your resources. Um, I would never stop somebody from killing Tree of Heaven, but you're you're starting down another entire campaign to try and get rid of that because Tree of Heaven can be a real pain in the butt to try and like eradicate. Well, that follows on to a next question that that Terry asked, and I'm assuming she's referring to Tree of Heavens that they attempted to cut down some trees and discovered the trees came back tenfold. <laughs> and they can't use chemicals. And so she's wondering, uh, would girdling the tree uh, kill the tree followed by a treatment to the stump? So if you can't use chemicals, er, that's a toughie. Um, unfortunately, to try and kill tree of heaven, if you're not using chemicals, um, you're talking about mechanically removing the tree and potentially trying to like remove the, the roots because they're all fairly meristematic, so they can send up runners and shoots even after the main trunk is cut down. Um, and the seed bank tends to be really dense, like millions of seeds. Um, it only persists for about two years. The seeds don't survive too long in the soil. But if you have no chemical option, you're looking at mechanical removal, really aggressive mechanical removal, and just consistent mulching to like kill off anything that might try and grow. Um, if you're looking at chemicals, you could do what they call the hack and squirt, which is um, not a girdle, but you actually injure the tree and you leave sections of bark intact. Um, I don't know what the ratio is exactly, but you would essentially use something like a hack to make a wound in the tree, you know, around the circumference. Um, and then you have to quickly apply a herbicide. You want to do that when the trees are starting to senesce. You don't want to do that like when the sap is rising so much. You want to catch them towards the you know, middle end of the summer. So like, you know, in your August going into September, start doing those wounds. So the idea is that the trees have intact cambium, you know, xylem and phloem. They're pulling it down to the root and the wounds you're making in the insecticide, or I'm sorry, the herbicide that you're applying are getting sucked down to the roots as much as possible and are killing those. Um, and expect to have to do that multiple times. I don't know that girdling will really kill tree of heaven. I've heard that the meristem, I'm sorry, that the cambium and seal really fast, like within, I think, someone told me within seconds of being injured, they can seal off and stop. So like making a wound might not really be so effective without applying herbicide very quickly. Um, girdling it, you kind of have to see, but I've definitely seen Tree of Heaven, it seems like it's been heavily girdled and somehow it's still kicking, like it's still got live branch up top. So I don't know exactly how effective just a pure girdle would be. Um, 
And if you cut it off and just have a stump sitting there and you paint that with something, you might not get really good uptake. The idea with hack and squirt is that you're leaving a lot of the cambium tissue intact and, um, and just applying that herbicide so that it's going to get taken throughout the system of the tree um, rather than, than like just a flat stump where you might not get the same level of, of flow. But, um, but yeah, it's, there's definitely a lot of different methods, but hack and squirt seems to be the most common method because um, cutting it down, yeah, you're looking at, at a lot of regrowth, very fast regrowth. Marlo asks, are there any uh, GIS maps or a dashboard tracking the spotted lanternfly available publicly? So there's something that I'm, I'm contemplating doing for the state, but it's a big, kind of a big ask to go and install. Um, iNaturalist is definitely one that people use. That's probably what I would recommend as far as public tracking or public reporting. If you're interested in something, um, I obviously would rather have folks do the reporting through the survey just because it's good for the State Department of Ag to get that information. Um, but if you just kind of want to see what other people are looking at and talking about, I would say would probably be the most straightforward um, platform to use. But yeah, I would love to put together a dashboard. That would be nice. Uh, and Liz is asking, the colors of all the stages are striking. Are they mimicking a toxic insect from Asia? And we also had another question about, are there any insects mimicking them? So native insects, no, um, not to my knowledge, because they've only been here for a few years. So I don't think there's any, is there a mimic insect that we should be careful not to harm when looking? Oh, I've got you. So, so yeah, not so much mimic but look-alike is a big one. Um, we get a lot of misidentifications. Uh, giant, uh, what is it called? The giant leopard spotted moth or just the leopard spotted moth are constantly misidentified for lanternfly. Um, if you know what lanternfly looks like, it's what we call a true bug. So it's got the, like, the ventral um, proboscis on its body, very pronounced compound eyes. Um, wings, it'll always have wings as a true bug, but a, a moth is obviously, it's not, it's not a hemipterin, it's a lepidopteran. It's got, you know, kind of that, the fuzzy um, CT over its wings. It's got big fluffy antenna, um, but from a distance, people see that kind of like spotty quality to the leopard spotted moth's wings, and they think lanternfly. Um, people will commonly misidentify um, box elder bugs, for whatever reason, as young lanternfly, um, I guess they kind of, but the felder bugs are native. Um, if you squish them, I think they're orange and they can stain. So if you want to do that kind of test, but um, people usually kind of freak out when they see like clusters of little spindly insects and they think they found lanternfly. But what they're looking at is something else. Um, I don't think anything particularly looks like lanternfly, but I've been staring at it for so long that like I know exactly what I'm looking at. So I would say just if you're curious, take a picture and email it to us. And we have a taxonomist who can positively identify literally any insect you look at. She's extremely good. Um, and otherwise, just try and familiarize yourself with lanternfly and don't squish anybody who you don't think is lanternfly. But as far as a native to Asia in the native range of lanternfly, I have no idea. Um, yeah, insects that go and adopt those colors are typically, um, I think they call that aposomatic, where they have warning colors to try and like warn predators away from eating them. Um, that very well could be the case. There's some thought that lanternfly might actually have a foul taste after feeding on Tree of Heaven. Um, I don't think that's been positively identified yet, but um, perhaps if they've got a, a bitter taste or a bad taste after they eat and they've got those big red hind wings that maybe they're they're trying to go for kind of an aposomatic effect it could also be an attractant you know for mates if um if they could see each other better there the red buggy range of, of view that they, they see those colors as very striking and are attracted to them um because we definitely find them feeding and mating and laying eggs kind of communally even though they're not a eusocial insect like they don't build nests or, you know, form hierarchies or anything, but, um, but they certainly group together. They like being together. And 
what do you see for the future? I mean, are they just going to keep marching south so they till they hit the Gulf of Mexico, or what do y'all anticipate? So that's a hard one to say. Um, the infestation is going to spread. Excuse me, it is going to spread um, as much as state and federal agencies can work to kind of slow it down. We will, but yeah, by and large, I would expect to see lanternfly continue to spread until it just hits ranges where it can't find food sources that it, that it likes or that it finds climate that doesn't work for it. But um, as to whether or not it can make it all the way to Florida, probably, if I had to be honest, it comes, it's a subtropical insect. So its ranges are, you know, India, um, which, you know, is, is a fairly, um, not tropical, but, you know, it definitely strikes a very hot, humid kind of environment. Um, if it can live in Maine, it can truly live all the way down to Florida. So we, um, I would not be surprised to find it down there in several years. Um, but I don't know what that kind of spread, like rate of spread would look like. Certainly for Maryland, it'll get, get worse. Like, I would think it would get worse in more locations, maybe in places that are already like real bad, like in Haverty Grace. It's about as bad as it could possibly be. And hopefully maybe start to back off a little bit. But um, yeah, Maryland is by no means out of the woods yet for its, its lanternfly invasion. Cindy asked, where was it first spotted in the U.S.? In Burke County, Pennsylvania. Um, they think it came in, they found it in 2014. They think it might've been there a year or two earlier. Um, and the thought is that it came over from contaminated stone that was shipped from an East Asian company or an East Asian location quarry, something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't know that it's been backtraced. I, I don't recall like if a company was positively identified as being the one that shipped the stone. Um, and I have no idea if there's a regulatory, you know, action that was taken, but um, yeah, it's been in the U.S. since 2014 confirmed. It's been in Maryland since 2018 that we actually confirmed its presence. Well, it's pretty new, thank really, as an invader. Thank you so much. Uh, this was yeah, super absolutely. and really informative. And I really want to thank all of our participants uh, for joining us at the Southern Maryland Audubon tonight. And uh, this recording will be recorded and uh, put in our archives um, so you can tell your friends to watch it. So thank you all very much. And this concludes our program. And thank you again so much, Kenton, for taking your time and sharing all your knowledge on this. Absolutely. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Y'all have a good night. Thanks. Good night.